All right, everyone, thank you for uh, returning with your lunch for our session uh, today on redistricting through a partisan lens. And, you know, from the hashtag of this conference, Fair Maps, I think a lot of people in the audience have the uh, kind of ethical perspective, like what would constitute a fair map or a just map or one that's maximally responsive to citizens and respects our democratic norms. I want you to put all of that in your backpack and trunk for a moment. And now think from an unabashedly partisan lens, the politically realistic perspective, kind of a Machiavellian, what are we trying to do to advantage our party? Because I think it's, uh, you can't really understand the dynamics of redistricting unless you're able to see things from both perspectives. That is the, the kind of moral and ethical perspective on one hand and then a partisan perspective on, another, on the other. And we have a, a couple of great folks here to explore this theme with us. Uh, to your right there is Chris uh, Jankowski, who is a Republican political strategist and consultant. He was the president of the Republican State Leadership Committee from 2011 to 2014 and was the executive director of the Red Map Project in the critical year 2010, to which we will return in a moment. Before that, he worked as assistant AG in South Carolina, among other jobs, and uh, it was recently, very recently, heavily involved in the Virginia Republican uh, campaign for governor and probably other uh, Republican campaigns in Virginia, and we'll revisit that also in the course of the discussion. Kelly Ward serves as the executive director at the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee, the DCCC. Uh, she was the DCCC's political director in 2012, where she oversaw the incumbent protection program and the committee's redistricting efforts, and the regional uh, political director for incumbent protection in 2010. Prior to joining the DCCC, Kelly managed several campaigns, including Alan Casey for U.S. Senate, Harry Mitchell in Arizona's 5th, and we're extremely proud of Kelly because she's an MPP graduate from the Harvard Kennedy School. Please welcome both of them. Um, now, I want to show you, is this syncing up? It's not. There, a couple of maps. Uh, these aren't only, I wish I had only the uh, legislative districts, but uh, these aren't legislative districts. These are trifectas. And what a trifecta is, is when both houses of a state legislature and the governor's office are controlled by the same party. And before the 2010 uh, election, there were 10 Republican trifecta states, 16 Democratic trifecta states, and 24 states didn't have trifectas. Okay, so this is the state of uh, the state level politics in 2010 on this dimension. This is the 2017 map before yesterday. So uh, in 2017, 26 states had Republican trifectas, six states had Democratic trifectas, and 18 were divided. Okay, so pretty dramatic transition. 2010, 2017. Now, not all of that, obviously, can be attributed to redistricting, and uh, it's probably impossible to tell how much of it is because of redistricting, but I do believe that redistricting played a significant role. And uh, I want to begin with kind of a canned, a stylized story about Red Map. Uh, this uh, passage is taken from the Red Map Project website. Uh, Red Map says, the rationale was straightforward. Controlling the redistricting process in these states would have the greatest impact on determining how both state legislative and congressional district boundaries would be drawn. Drawing new district lines in states was the, uh, with the most redistricting activity presented the opportunity to solidify conservative policymaking at the state level and maintain a Republican stronghold in the U.S. House of Representatives for the next decade. Right, so that was the kind of avowed explicit strategy. How did they do that? In a great MSNBC interview with Chris in 2015 with Rachel Maddow, which I encourage you to, to watch, uh, Maddow says Chris is her nominee for the political genius uh, of, you know, whatever, the year award because of this, uh, this strategy. So what was the strategy? The strategy was to raise a bunch of 
money from Republican donors who'd been focused on high-profile national elections and say, no, no, don't focus on those elections. Focus on smaller elections that you probably never heard of, but in which the payoff is you'll be able to win uh, majorities in state houses all over the country. And so what you want to do is take the dollars and maximize the number of state-level majority wins. And then, because this is happening in 2010, you've got the wind at your back because Obama's president, and we know that the out party has the wind in its sails in the first midterm elections. And then also, you've got the census happening, so you'll get a chance to redistrict. And if you have a majority and you can redistrict, you can lock in this uh, party control for a little while. Okay, so that's the stylized red map story. So first question to Chris, what would you delete from or add to modify this story? Maybe it's grossly unfair. Maybe you like it. I don't know. Well, what do you it's, think? It's my memo, so uh, <laughs> can you all hear me all right? Yeah. All right. Um, I, the, the Genius Committee is meeting right now, uh, having seen what I accomplished in Virginia last night. Um, so uh, take everything with a grain of salt. Um, I think it's uh, my political consulting uh, from the beginning is always focused on states down ballot, so-called down ballot uh, area. And I did start uh, in the AG's office in South Carolina briefly, and I was a very average law student at a very average law school and tried to drop out almost every semester to join a campaign. <laughs> um, but I was paying my way through school, so I couldn't do that. Uh, quickly got into it. but. It's sort of like my, my high school basketball career, a junior varsity star. And so, uh, and, and Washington, state stuff is kind of junior varsity. And unless you're a U.S. Senator, Congressional, or running for president, eh, eh. So, me and a couple guys had started a group, uh, its own national group, just to focus on the down ballot stuff. And, you know, we made some progress, but by 09, we couldn't get anywhere. So we said, hey, we're going to get the attention of the big guys and show them a plan that for pennies on the dollar will have an impact on what they care about, Congress. We didn't care about Congress. We wanted that map to be read for state reasons. And so it was a twofer that created trifectas, if that's a, it's not too much. Um, I, I essentially that, I, I think that the, I have a number of other thoughts in general, but uh, the, 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 it was a great year in 2010. Uh, there's no question that Republicans would have been in a good spot in redistricting without red map because of 2010. We didn't know that at the time. Uh, but I don't think Wisconsin would have happened. I don't think the Michigan House would have happened. Um, the ability to show up and put seven figures at the right time to people that we believed knew what they were doing, they just never got the money before, uh, that made an impact. And so um, some of my Republican friends want to argue and say, ah, there's nothing to see here, nothing to see here. Well, we did something. And um, I, I guess we could spend the rest of the time talking about what we did because I feel like it's greatly exaggerated from there. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Good. So next question is, is to Kelly. Uh, beginning with this as a baseline, is this something that the DCCC and the, well, not just the D, but the uh, Democratic Party strategists should learn from more broadly, seek to emulate, seek to build upon? Or do you think for some reason this is the wrong direction to go? Well, I think that there's no question um, in 20, can y'all hear me? Um, I think there's no question that in that same cycle of, you know, winning that we had a big wave in 2006 that brought in Democrats control to, of, of the House. And then um, obviously Barack Obama was elected in 2008. So we had two very big national cycles. And I think in that 2009, 2010 cycle, Democrats were very much focused on Washington, very much looking up. Um, I think Democrats tend to do that anyway. But that particular, you know, very important, ended up being a very important two year cycle, to your point, leading up into the census. Um, Democrats very much were focused on the the House, the presidency, we had complete control of Washington, we're getting a lot done, um, and so we didn't focus very much on the states that same cycle. So I think it was the one-two punch of, um, you know, the Republicans very focused on the local level in that key cycle, the Democrats not focused on it, uh, and then the wave of 2010 as a backlash to um, Barack Obama's presidency, to your point about midterms, um, really pushing that, that money and that investment very far into the map. We certainly did not have our eye on the ball as 
Democrats at that time. Um, what we're trying to do is to certainly learn those lessons, not just about the importance of redistricting, which I think has entered the consciousness of America in a way it didn't at that time. Um, I think part of why the Red Map effort was able to be so successful is because there wasn't a lot of attention on the state legislatures in the redistricting process. There wasn't an awareness about redistricting um, in, in the consciousness of most people. Um, there really, there wasn't a, a massive attention and effort to in influence to in the process to understand what the impact of gerrymandering can be. We just weren't there yet. We're in a new mentality. So I think as Democrats, we're trying to learn those lessons and really internalize the impact that gerrymandering can have on, on Democrats politically, but also on democracy, which I think we've seen over the last six years. Um, and so to learn those lessons, but also to understand how can we make it fair? You know, what is the, as close to fairness as we can get? Um, you know, we as the National Democratic Redistricting Committee, we've owned that redistricting is a political process, right? I mean, we put Democrat in our title. We are, we are trying very hard to elect Democrats because we know, and, and you proved, that the, the very first mover in redistricting is to make sure that the elected officials who are drawing the maps is a fair playing field. If it's not, you're going to skew one way or the other. And so how can we make sure that we have Democrats at the table so we don't get locked out again? You know, we're trying to own that um, and make sure we address it and be strategic about it, which certainly is a lesson from the Republicans. But we're also also trying to build on top of that with other areas of redistricting impact like litigation, um, you know, really defining fairness, defining what maps, you know, should look like in this day and age, and those other elements of what we're all talking about at the conference here. Mm -hmm. So a uh, quick follow-up, or maybe not so quick, a follow-up on that. Can you talk a little bit about what the uh, Democratic Party strategy is to counter some of the heavily uh, re uh, gerrymandered, partisan gerrymandered state, a lot of them, you know, with North Carolina and Wisconsin being quite extreme examples, but, but many, many others, the uh, redistricting that dis severely disadvantages Democratic candidates. Sure. Well, there's a couple things that are happening. The first is, um, you saw this right after, in the 2012 cycle, uh, after maps were drawn, there were a series of lawsuits that were filed right away, starting in that cycle, to just say, no, no, no. This is illegal. What you just did, that's like illegal. It like violates a bunch of constitutional stuff. You can't be doing that. And there were a bunch of lawsuits that were filed that cycle. Um, they take time, right? A lot of you were out of law school. Um, lawsuits take time. And so we saw the fruits of those lawsuits in the 2016 cycle where, fun fact, four of the nine seats that we picked up in the House in 2016 were as a result of lawsuits that were filed in 2012 against the gerrymandered maps in Virginia and Florida. So right away there was a litigation effort, and there's been a lot of people in this room that have continued with litigation efforts against congressional maps and state legislative maps. There also, though, has been been an, an effort to raise the consciousness of this issue. What we have seen in our democracy is the impact of having polarized legislative bodies where one party controls the entire process and isn't at the, at the mercy or the accountability of the voters and really skews to care more about their primaries because that's where their electoral success comes from. And the, the, the long-term effect of that on governing and on democracy and on the polarization of Congress and the state legislative bodies, that is a real problem. And there has been an effort, not just by the Democrats, but by democracy, you know, by the Brennan Center and the AP and, and reporters and, and other academics to say the, the gerrymandering is part of this and it's part of the cultural problem and breakdown that we're seeing in our legislatures. And so let's talk about that. And, and you're really seeing the, the conversation around gerrymandering come into the consciousness. And that is a very important dynamic for the next round. Mm -hmm. Good. So uh, I want to move to Virginia, as uh, a lot of people have been thinking about looking at Virginia. Uh, last night, the Virginia House of Delegates swung from a 66-34 Republican majority to, uh, it's kind of knife edge now, as I understand it, 49-47 in favor of the Democrats with four seats too close to call, according to Ballotopedia at 1130 or something like that. So uh, I want to explore for the uh, next few minutes how, if at all, do the results of the Virginia election alter our view of the problem of gerrymandering? And this one is to Chris, perhaps Virginia's district map, which many saw as drawn to favor Republicans pretty strongly, is not as effective as the Republicans had hoped and the Democrats had feared. Well, apparently so. Uh, <laughs> I want to make a case for complexity 
on this panel. Uh, we're at Harvard Law. We can be complex. Um, there's so many assumptions that are that a lot of what Kelly said are is that are that need to be looked at. And I think that so to answer the question, Virginia is an example. Uh, the House of Delegates was drawn to, they had a supermajority at one point in a state where we haven't won a statewide race as a party since 2009, um, and Hillary Clinton carried it by five and a half points, Obama twice before that. We had a supermajority in one house, and it was subject to litigation, is subject to litigation. I mean, that's just, I think you got, you know, when you overreach for that last cookie, sometimes the cookie <laughs> jar comes down on you, and... Um, <laughs> That's what we saw in some <laughs> respects. Uh, but also what we see is what's going on in America. And one of the things about RedMap that made RedMap look so smart now is because 2014 happened. 2010 and 2014 were wave elections, as I, I define them, uh, certainly on the state level. Um, and it's the first time in the history of the U.S. that two wave elections occurred within four years that benefited the same party. So we had a little campfire, and gasoline was thrown on it, all right? So that does not, I'm not trying to absolve myself, because I do not apologize. But I think if you're trying to say, oh, my gosh, they've been disenfranchised, and this is awful, um, some. But last night, a lot of Virginia voters got re-enfranchised. <laughs> um, and that's because they turned out and voted. And, uh, you know, essentially a, a, what I believe when we see the voter file is uh, there was about a 5 to 6 percent hard Democrat vote that never participates in our governor's races that came out. And they were, if you look where Marco Rubio did well in Virginia, it was one of his best states in the Republican primary, you look in those precincts, that's where we as Republicans lost mm -hmm. in Republican precincts, suburbs. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm getting a little far afield, but, but the number one thing is America right now is going through such transformation and such upheaval socially, and um, I, I, I believe the U.S. Senate is pretty polarized, and we haven't gerrymandered that yet. Um, I, Kelly probably disagrees a little bit, but um, I believe the presidential <laughs> primaries, the presidential primaries that we went through. We had Bernie Sanders over here, and you name it over here, and people in between. I think America's polarized, and I think uh, academic research shows yeah, sure. they self-sort. We get in our own little information flow, and that's all we hear. And to just say, oh, my God, RedMap, you did this, and you've ruined the country, I mean, come on. I, I mean, I, it is a factor. And so there's other factors. I've probably gone on too long on this answer. No, that's but good. that's the biggest thing is that redistricting and gerrymandering is fundamentally about trying to predict future voter behavior. And we're pretty good at it, both sides, but we're not perfect. Because why? Because voter behavior changes. Good. It changed in Virginia yesterday. People who never cared about a governor's race came out and said, I care and I'm going to screw Trump. And they did. And <laughs> you may say, well, that's an anomaly. Well, my gosh, look at the last 12 years of elections in America and tell me we, we don't have some anomalies going on, yeah. you know? President Obama, President Trump. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. So, uh, Kelly, you're probably not going to like this question very much because your comments have gone in a different direction. But the question is, if, uh, if these four undecided, you know, kind of too close to call seats swing toward uh, the Democrats and the Democrats get a majority in Virginia in the Senate and so that they have both houses uh, by 2020, do you think their strat would you advise their strategy to maximize partisan advantage when they get to redistrict? Uh, well, the answer to that is no. Um, but let's come back to that. And just on a note about Virginia, because I, you know, I think what Chris is saying about the country being polarized is right, um, and the impact of two-wave elections is fair. But the, the dynamic of what's happening in Virginia, and I think what could happen in the 2018 election, is this is historic. 
right? We're on the other side of those historic waves. This was a historic election. You had historic turnout. I mean, the highest turnout that, that Virginia has seen in at least 20 years, if not ever. Um, Nor Ralph Northam won more votes for governor of Virginia than any governor candidate, any gubernatorial candidate in the history of Virginia. Um, you had historic you know, candidates being elected, the first trans candidate um, to both a legislature in yes. Virginia and to a city council um, in, in Minnesota. You had just you know, the first two Latina candidates that had been elected to the Virginia House. I mean, it was a historic election for a lot of reasons, partially because I agree with you, the country is going through a lot right now. Um, but it shouldn't take tsunami level elections in order to maybe tie, maybe in the House of Delegates, right? Ralph Northam won by nine points. What you would normally see if the, if the legislative map is reflecting the electorate, that legislative map will follow suit, which is what we saw in 2010, where that wave then did have a down ballot crash because the maps were, you know, certainly more fair than they are now. Um, that didn't happen. We, we might win it. I think we probably will in the end. But that doesn't mean it's not gerrymandered. And that doesn't mean that gerrymandering doesn't affect the ability to win that body. We should have won it last night out Right, and it should have been parallel to what happened in the historic gubernatorial election. We we barely hit 50-50, and now it's too close to call. So so it's the, the gerrymandering really does have an effect, and the Virginia House of Delegates outcome doesn't negate that. In the same way that it is very possible that the House of Representatives could go Democratic in 2018, that doesn't mean it's a gerrymandered map, that it's not a gerrymandered map, right? I mean, we have seen the delegations in Ohio, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Virginia, Florida, you know, Michigan, go, go from competitive delegations that reflected the competitiveness of the state to one party being totally locked out of those states for the last six years under wave and or neutral environment. So maybe we'll pick up a couple in those states and maybe on net across the country it's going to be enough to um, take back the 24 seats we need, largely through states like California and the suburbs, in addition to the gerrymandered states. That doesn't negate or, or, or mean that gerrymandering isn't a problem and wasn't a problem. We, we certainly you know, should recognize the complexity. I'm, I'm super excited to hear Republicans say, let's be more complex. It doesn't happen very often. Um, <laughs> uh, I feel like that's our job. Uh, we're like, well, nuance. Um, but, uh, <laughs> just teasing. Um, but, but it certainly, it, 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 it don't, don't, you know, we need to disentangle a, a tsunami level election, which this might be, with the fundamental impact and reality of the gerrymandering. Good. So, uh, I do want to press you a little bit, so let me add a couple more qualifications. So say the Supreme Court has decided Gil, Gil v. Whitford, Common Cause v. Raucho has, have been decided, and it's the status quo. It's fine to partisan gerrymanders to say that's the majority opinion. Why wouldn't you advise a major, you know, double majority in Virginia to redistrict for partisan advantage? I mean, look. The, the, we are political. We are partisan. Um, we are owning that. When, you know, I, Attorney General Eric Holder, former Attorney General Eric Holder is our chair, um, he and President Obama worked together to start this organization and to support it. Um, and, you know, they had a, a real discussion about whether to uh, tackle gerrymandering through the nonpartisan, um, you know, efforts of reform and commissions and, and, and ballot initiatives and, and those kinds of kind of nonpartisan efforts. The reality of redistricting is that it is a political process. You are 100% right about that. And in 37 of the 50 states, redistricting is done by politicians. It's, you know, maps are drawn by the legislature and signed by the governor. So if you don't start with owning that elections matter and, and who's in those offices matter, then you're missing the vast majority of the reality of, of, of politics and of redistricting. Now, just because we personally, and I think, you know, Democrats, we're owning that we got to get Democrats into those seats, like we want to have the pen, um, or at least a seat <laughs> and share the pen. Um, we don't then need to do what the Republicans did. And, in, you know, in fairness to Chris, that was legislatures, right? I mean, you sort of like did your thing and then legislatures took over and legislators did what they do and it, it is pol it is political redistricting is a very parochial very political process i've been involved in it for a long time it is it's hard it's icky it's parochial but that doesn't mean that the goal is gerrymandering. It doesn't mean that the goal is to lock one party in and lock one party out. And the thing to remember, sorry to go on for too long, but the thing to remember is that 
prior to 2011, the vast majority of redistricting was around incumbent protection, which isn't necessarily good. I actually don't think that's good. Um, but the gerrymandering that you saw and, and you know, the, the deal cutting and the political stuff that you saw was largely around incumbent protection, or it would be around like, okay, fine, you can have the Senate, we'll get the House, and it's deal making. It didn't lock out a party and lock in party control like 2011. That's the difference. And we don't want to do that. We don't want to do that. I think one of the things that's so interesting to me about what the conference is really digging in, you know, we've talked about this, like really digging in on what is fairness? What, what is a fair map? What is a good map? How do you draw a map that reflects the will of the people when you have real realities like the social unrest of our country right now or, you know, the geographic packing, the sort of natural unemployment intended gerrymandering of Democrats that live in cities. You know, th those are real dynamics. It doesn't mean we just like throw up our hands and say, well, Democrats live in cities, you know, guess we'll have gerrymandering. It's like, how do we make sure we are still representing fairness and getting a representative democracy out of the redistricting process? And these are hard questions. And we layer into that the tools and the innovations that you have now to analyze maps. This stuff is hard and it's tricky, but we got to get in it and wrestle and try to, you know, really understand what a good map is. And, and our job for real life like what we want to do is have that conversation and you know have the the tools and the analysis and the community and the conversation and the grassroots participation in the process in 2021 and 22 so that the maps are as fair and just as they can be at the end of the process mm. For real life. Yeah. Like, we are not trying to gerrymander for Democrats. I don't think it's good. Like, we don't want to break the system for us. Like, you're right that it's complex and nuanced, but it, it is the gerrymandering has contributed to the polarization. It is a statement of fact. And so why would we want to do that for us? It's just it doesn't. So I want to let know? Chris jump in in a yeah. second. But I guess I, in a way I don't understand your answer because, look, <laughs> if the Republicans are trying to gerrymander and the Democrats are trying to generate fair maps, won't you lose? I mean, this is the problem Democrats face all the time, right? Um, we're like, we want to we want to do the right thing. And Republicans are like, we want to win. And then they win. And we're like, dang it. Um, it, it. We just wanted to do the right thing. It's, you know, I don't think it has to be different. I, I think that they're, frankly, I mean, I'm a Democrat. This is a partisan panel. Like, I think that what's good for Democrats and what's good for democracy is, is often the same thing. Um, and so, so, am I missing your face? <laughs> um, <laughs> So, I, I, you know, I think that we can have fair maps. I think that we just want to compete. The problem right now is, except for in these tsunami elections like we might have this time, it's very hard for us to compete in these seats. You can't break through. And, and the, what the voters want doesn't then reflect in the election outcomes. So we don't want that. We want competitiveness. We want to be able to compete. We want to be able to win on our merits, on our campaign strategy. You know, we're locked right now. We're, we're bumping up against walls. We, we want a, the system to be fair, and then we think we'll do fine. We think Democrats will win under that scenario. So it's not a distinction in our mind. Okay. Good, Chris, you want to jump in? So this, this is what I mean by complexity. <laughs> All right, 20, the Democrats need 24 U.S. House seat pickups for next year and to take control. Hillary Clinton won 23 congressional districts, held that also on the same day, by the same voters, elected a Republican congressman. Mm -hmm. All right, you can't say that those voters were disenfranchised. You can't. Can you say that we still had an inherent advantage? Absolutely. Okay. Mitt Romney won 15 of those 23. Um, Trump won, I think, 35 or 36 that had gone Obama, which is... Um, so, but that's <laughs> complex. Did. That's complex. And we all, particularly smart people, I think, miss the fact that maybe people with less education just have reasons for doing things. You know, maybe they like that congressman because they've met him or he did something in their district that was good, but they hated Trump. You know, I mean, it would be easy to say, oh, be quiet, Jankowski. This this narrative sounds a lot more compelling, but it's complicated. Um, now, in her defense, when we do have a district, congressional district that favors us, that hurts her recruitment. So you never even see the best co Democrat run. I would concede that. So there's a lot of different things. But, um, you know, and then retirements, a bad political environment accelerates retirements for incumbents, which creates opportunities for my party to nominate 
weak candidates um, and lose some of these well-drawn seats. So um, it's complex, and, I, and I'm not, and I'm, and what I am for, and uh, to speaking for me, not my party. I'm for fairer districts. I'm for reform. I, I believe there should be guardrails in place, but I do not believe that they should be taken out of the hands of the elected. I do not believe in these commissions. There you go. <laughs> that, that was just like the elections yesterday. Yeah, people <laughs> some of those. So, um, but I, I don't, I don't buy that, and room. I'm more than willing, and I've said that publicly. And um, and what's going to happen in Virginia? I mean, Ralph Northam pledged that he would do something bipartisan. If the legislature won't adopt it, we really need to amend our state constitution. Um, Ralph's going to do something bipartisan, um, and you know what? In Virginia. All you have to do is make it a little bit better, and it's going to be really good for the Democrats. <laughs> so um, that's a different problem. But um, I, I take Ralph Northam as word. No mm -hmm. one worked with him. He's, he, they're going to do that. Um, and, and my client, plug, Jill Vogel for lieutenant governor, she got the most votes any Republican running statewide for state office, not U.S. Senator or President, has ever received. Um, so there was an elevated turnout on both sides, just more on theirs. There was a heightened interest. Um, so... Anyway. Can, I, can I agree with Chris on something? Um, and I actually think there's a lot of agreement. Um, I think you're, you're not wrong that taking the process out of the hands of the politicians isn't necessarily the answer. I think we need to be very thoughtful about commissions and reform as the thing because it's not it's – not, first of all, not all reforms are created equal. Not all commissions are good. Not all commissions make it less partisan, ironically. Um, so we need to not just say commissions are the solution. We need to be very thoughtful with that. And there are a lot of states where the politicians do it, and it's fine, and it works, and the maps are competitive, and they reflect the will of the voters, and it, it works. There are also commission states that work, like Arizona, which I was involved in. You know, it, it's a very interesting and important commission. Um, so I, I think it, it's right that there, there's a way to do redistricting that, that anchors in the fundamental tenets of fairness and justice and what is right for the voters of that state. Um, th that's not what we have right now because well, we can get into the weeds on things like the suburbs that Clinton wins and we lose, but um, the, the bottom line is we shouldn't just assume that commissions are the answer and that reforming the process is the answer. There's a way that participation and, and you know things like academic definition on maps and these really new innovative cool tools that you heard about a little bit this morning and we'll hear more about mm -hmm. that analyze maps that get into the hands of legislators legislators that work to do the right thing like you see in, in a lot of states you know that that all can be a recipe for good outcomes it doesn't have to be taken out of the hands of the politicians mm -hmm. Arizona I'm so glad you brought that up <laughs> there's somebody from the Arizona Commission yes. okay so <laughs> the Arizona State Senate maps are essentially drawn 15 15 they only have 30 seats it's one of the smallest state senates in the country and I believe any objective person would say they are drawn 15-15, okay? Uh, at a state level, uh, Arizona is fairly Republican state and traditionally would have 16, 17, 18, 19 Republican seats. So that is a politically regressive map that doesn't match that state, all right? We still have the majority because, um, well, for a lot of reasons, but 2014 was good. Um, but it, it's close, and we've, we tried to blow ourselves up in our primary process, and we didn't. But um, it, that to me is fundamentally unfair, and, and oh, not to impugn the integrity of anyone, but it is also true that one of the consultants, the demographers, and the data firms involved with helping the commission draw their maps had also previously done consulting for President Obama's campaign. I mean, I, I just think that undermines confidence. And fundamentally, the reason why I don't want the politicians not to do this is because First, it's built into our system. You know, the instinct to gerrymander is almost as old as a republic. Um, so I think the founders might have been somewhat aware of this. But as soon as you take that mouse and you start clicking and you start moving, every move has a partisan effect, or a lot of them, a, a couple key turns along the road. And I don't think you can take the politics out of that. If you put me in charge, I, I couldn't help myself. I mean, and I, I, I would just know... I would know, ooh, that subdivision, mm, don't think so. They're going through this problem. You know, I would just know, and my counterparts would just know. And um, I don't believe there's these saints that are going to be appointed to a commission who don't know. Yeah. 
So I think this is where I depart from both panelists. You know, Klausowitz said that uh, that war is business too important to be left to the generals. I think districting is something too important to be left to the elected politicians. But let's go with the sense of the panel and that you want to, the political path, because as you said, you can't take politics out of it. If it's not an independent commission, if it's not like the California Citizens Redistricting Commission, if it's left in the legislatures and you want fair maps, then I think you kind of have to explore Alex's pattern that he laid out this morning. And so redistricting has become weaponized, I believe, for both sides. But there have been times in history when it's been less weaponized because uh, the dominant party doesn't want to totally entrench because they might lose next time and they don't want the other guys to totally entrench. Now, right now, it feels like we're in a in a moment in which it's very, very weaponized and those kind of considerations and restraints don't really hold very much. What would it take politically to create the conditions and incentives for a kind of detente where, you know, there's always, somebody's always going to have a majority where they don't use that majority to weaponize redistricting in a way that we see in so many states right now? What are those political conditions? What does that look like? Um. Well, I think that uh, this is becoming more and more uh, an issue for voters, uh, slowly. And to me, it reminds me of when I was in high school in the 1980s, and they talk about recycling. And I'd be like, <laughs> now it's redistricting. nobody here is against recycling, but nobody's going to recycle. All right? <laughs> Just so you know. Um, I feel like this argument, this conversation is so fundamentally, obviously unfair to take and, 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 you know, have a partisan, over undo, I'll say undo partisan influence, that it will correct itself. My client, Jill Vogel, a Republican, she, in, she had introduced in the state Senate redistricting reform. There is a growing movement. The, my problem is I'm very skeptical. I don't like to disarm. I, I, I really want to see what the alternative is. The other thing is, and I, I think the panel talked about this before I caught the end of it, um, even if the Supreme Court uh, rules that partisan uh, purpose is impermissible on whatever grounds they decide, there's going to be litigation. So suddenly the road is, you know, the walls are this wide, then now it's like this, but the lawyers still fit in there. They're still going to fight, you know? <laughs> if you didn't get what you want, you're going to get through there. You're going to fight. All right? So that's, for sure. that's going to happen. Um, so um, I don't think we're ever going to get rid of that, but we can still make it fair. I don't offer that as an excuse, but more of a uh, reality. But I think from my side, very nervous about, you know, So the politics of it, you're saying that it has to be a, a popular issue and citizens out there have to care about fair districts to make it in the incentive of politicians. To, right, right. Yeah. Like with anything. Yeah. yeah, I think the grassroots participation and the citizen participation in the redistricting process next time is clutch. It is very important, y'all, so get ready. Um, the, sorry, the Tea Party, who probably has an approval rating of one in this room, um, <laughs> they are 100% on board with this. They hate this. They hate the idea of politicians picking their voters instead of voters picking yeah, their yeah, politicians. Right, right. So. There you but, go. but can I there offer, um, in addition to the political reality that needs to happen, I think we need to think really hard about the criteria. I think that when you look at the traditional redistricting criteria and the criteria that has always been assumed as good for redistricting, that might not be the case anymore, y'all. Like the world's turning upside down, right? And I think in order for Anyone who's drawing maps, whether it's a commission or a partisan elected official or, a, uh, you know, an elected official trying to do the right thing, I think really thinking hard about the criteria of, you know, compactness, communities of interest, you know, contiguity of districts, preserving the Voting Rights Act, like, what does that mean right now? And, and can't, how do you do that and be fair? How do you do that in, and maximize what's good using the technology that's available to us? I think, you know, looking at the geographic reality of where people live in the country, um, you know, I think that, that one thing that's very important for all of us to think hard about prior to the next round of redistricting is what th should the criteria be? And, and are we at a point in our country where we need to rethink or maybe revisit or at least recommit to, um, to the criteria? You know, one anecdotal evidence of this, I guess, and, and there's actually been a lot of studies about the um, packing of, of, you know, Democratic voters just because of they choose to live in cities and, and what does that mean and those kinds of factors. When the Republican Party rolled out their counterpart to our organization about a month ago, 
they said, here's what we stand for. As a partisan organization whose job is to preserve the status quo of gerrymandering and preserve the power of the Republicans to control the map the way you just saw, they said very openly, we stand for the following things. Compact districts, preserving communities of interest, complying with federal laws and the Voting Rights Act, um, and, and keeping things status quo. That is what they said they want. And that is a partisan Republican organization whose goal is to lock in a red map. So like, are we sure we want that? We, we just, and maybe we do. And, and maybe there's a way to be, you know, intentional about creating fairness in those dynamics, maybe. And I don't know that we can change criteria. I'm just throwing it out there because you smart people should think about this. I think these are the kinds of questions that we need to get at in order to lay the groundwork for fairness, no matter who's drawing the maps. So this is a, this is a question for both of you and you, you, that kind of goes there and thinking about fairness, what ought the criteria be for fairness or the limitations on unfairness? And Gil, you know, in the prior cases, there's a, you know, there's a lot of different criteria that I, I don't, I think I have a fair amount of skepticism that a, a judge would actually want to rule on some number about the efficiency gap or asymmetric disproportionality, you know, kind of, no, it's 30 percent. No, it's 20. You know, that's kind of hard to see uh, any justice, you know, deciding on a number like that. But is it something like that? Some, some numbers like that should set the boundaries on fairness or are, do we go back to the traditional criteria of, of compactness and natural communities, et cetera? Or do you have something else in mind, either a target for fairness or guardrails by which all of us could say, oh yeah, if you cross those guardrails, that's definitely unfair. I think just those standards she laid out, the, the Republicans, uh, <laughs> a judge <laughs> can take those and apply those to some of the maps that are in existence, and I think they would warrant a change. Um, uh, I'm not involved in that effort. I, those are my friends, and I <laughs> met with them and gave my input on their project. Um, but uh, you know, uh, I do think that that's kind of the consensus position on our side. It's very nebulous. It's still a lot of litigation. I like the numbers idea. I, and when I heard about the sufficiency gap, I, uh, you know, I was like, well, perfect, because numbers don't lie, right? Numbers have no purpose, no, no, no ill intent. They're just numbers. But the formula has some subjectivity to it. And I've read the articles on it, and I still haven't given up on it, though. Like, that's what I would like to see. So something like that is appealing. Yeah, but, but is not a... like this is, this is the number you have to hit. This is one range on that number. Here's the other range. Give it a range, all right, um, and measure it subsequently. I don't know. I'm just making this up. But there's got to be a way that, that's, that's fair enough uh, and keeps it in the hands of the politicians. So maybe... Republican Democratic leadership could meet at Camp David and decide on what those numbers are. That, that ain't happening. <laughs> I mean, look at, I mean, it's just, yeah. Kelly, do you, do you have thoughts on the well, fairness? Well, I think there's real value in the academic metrics that are being created around the country. I think the efficiency gap is one. I think you're going to hear from some of the, um, the folks in that who are developing these, um, and there are a number of them, and, and people smarter than me are going to explain them to you. But one thing that um, is, is, I think, important to know or something to think about to your point about not picking one you know there are four or five metrics even right now that you can layer on top of a map um, the efficiency gap being one you know the projections on polarization using factors of um, you know consumer behavior and demographic behavior and, and those kinds of factors um, when you put the analyses on top of current maps the same outcomes are generated, you know, it, meaning the those different analyses looking at the maps in different ways, which is not necessarily compactness. It's not necessarily traditional redistricting criteria. It's new measurements um, of what of, of fairness. It, they all say that the maps are unfair, right? And they all say the same maps are unfair. So you see the same states, Pennsylvania, you know, Michigan, Ohio, Wisconsin, North Carolina, they all surface to the top as unfair by a number of different metrics. So to your point, you know, maybe there, there is a boundary of some sort. Maybe there is a way to, you know, uh, the application of these five metrics tell us that this map is polarized or this map is partisan. Um, you know, I think we need to use the tools that currently exist. We need to lean in into this innovation of continuing to define and, and think critically about what fairness means. Um, you know, I think personally, one 
one factor that's underappreciated is competitiveness. And, and that's more of an anecdotal comment based off my experience working with members and working with Congress and watching the legislative process. You know, competitiveness matters. When you have a member in a competitive district, they just behave differently. They just do. They are more accountable to their voters. They are more present in their um, in their job. They are more aware. They're, they're, they're more you know, in tune and in touch as elected officials because their job is on the line, right? And that matters. And so, you know, I think how we bring competitiveness into this conversation um, and also make sure that we preserve, you know, power building of communities and, and, you know, really making sure that diverse voices are represented. All of those are important and and, and tricky and and we need to nuance and really, you know, make sure we're doing right by the diversity of of our country and the different ways to represent that diversity. But I just think that, you know, the, the more Competitive a district, the more um, the more in tune to the to the you know to the job that you. And that's not the right way to say it because members of Congress are very good people and they do good by their jobs, no matter whether district they're in. But the competitiveness of knowing that you have to go home every weekend, that you have to really you know be you got to find the middle. You got to find the middle. You got to compromise. You got to you know not be polarized. It, it's sort of generates that type of behavior, and, and maybe that's good. Um, those are the kinds of questions I think we can and should surface, and, and somewhere in all of this, there are good answers. I think the bottom line point is to think critically and not just rest on the way things have always d- been done. We don't have to do that anymore. We have all these cool new tools. <laughs> Computers. Right. <laughs> Great. All right, so I think it's uh, time to open it up to the audience. I think people have a, a lot on their minds. Yes. Dude, somebody can bring you a, a microphone. Right. We have a couple mics, roving mics. Thank you. Um, my name is Burl Hartman, and I work with a group called Environmental Entrepreneurs. And my question has to do with a book that I just finished reading, whose name I can't say in public. <laughs> begins with the word rat. And um, according to, the, to one of the citations there, this, there's this international group that decides whether or not a country is democratic or not. And they said the state of North Carolina is no longer should qualify as democratic. And one word you, I haven't heard here, which I'm surprised about, is voter suppression. I realize that technically that's a different issue, but the combination of gerrymandering and voter suppression has done in, uh, inestimable damage, I think, to our democratic process. So I'd like to ask Chris if, in light of this, you still think you should go ahead and be as partisan as you can. <laughs> well, it is disappointment that the book was named what it was named, because um, <laughs> I, I wanted to give it to my kids. Uh, they found it anyway and read it. Um, <laughs> Uh, high school. Uh, so I don't think I said we should just go be as partisan as possible. Uh, uh, but I do not yield. In t- I would not yield until I see like which, what the alternative is and, and is it fairly applied. Um, I probably am not going to comment on North Carolina uh, or any map in place because I had nothing to do with them and don't want to become involved. Um, (laughs) I was in law school long enough to learn that. Um, (laughs) And um, I would say I really, I just, I completely object to this idea of voter suppression. I think, um, I think you can, I I don't know what you're talking about, but I've heard it from other people, voter ID, voter You're talking voting places, election functioning change, yes. right? Um, I think all of those should be subject to the strictest look in terms of uh, mainly outside of voter ID. In Virginia, we have a voter ID law. The Fourth Circuit upheld it, um, and it dis- it didn't seem to you know, stop a favorable outcome. I, I think that uh, where we're heading in America is uh, voting e- more easily, like mail ballots are big and coming. Uh, in Virginia, we have these absurd absentee ballot rules that are very restrictive, and you have to sign this form. Um, Democrats, for some reason, are less available on Election Day than Republicans. 
and I've, I, I don't know what they do, but I know when I go to my Republicans, and I've run so many, uh, you know, these restrictive absentee ballot things, they don't want to sign the form. They don't, no, I'm, I can make it. And um, then there's also this paranoia that I just learned about that they don't think their vote's going to be counted. Um, and so I believe that we need to make voting as easy as possible, early voting, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> but <laughs> we need to protect the integrity of who is voting. And I do not think it is unreasonable to confirm their ID. Anybody that goes to vote, if they for some reason are denied, they can cast a provisional ballot. And if the election is in doubt, and they are, I mean, we were going to fight over some provisional ballots in Virginia. There's one House seat by 12 votes. There's another one by 49 votes. The closest state legislative race I've ever won was uh, Arkansas, I think. It was nine votes. And we took control of the House in Arkansas by nine votes in one seat. Every vote does count. Every vote does matter. And I don't think it's too much to ask that we have some integrity as we make it easier for people to vote. Other questions? Uh, Carmen. Carmen Siriani, I'm at the Ash Center in Brandeis University. Hey. <laughs> this is for Kelly. Um, I, I think the way you pose that competitiveness matters and that we should try to figure out the design to find the middle and to compromise. I want to push you a little bit further and just wonder out loud, because some of us here have been involved in the other forms of civic collaboration, multi-stakeholder deliberation, et cetera, trust building across typical lines. Is there some way to align that your competitiveness ideal with that? Um, or is that just a different world, a different universe? And I don't know the answer at all. Well, I think anything, anything done right is always based in trust, um, always. And I think that building trust across boundaries, you know, whether it's you know diverse communities or people who are different from each other in, from a partisan perspective or you know background or ethnicity or what it might be, you know, we should all build trust um, in those, you know, as a starting point always. And I and I think we can. And I think, you know, I, I think the thing that's interesting about the Arizona Commission is that competitiveness was added as one of the criteria. So you have the four traditional criteria. And then the, the commission, when it was created on the ballot, sent to voters, they, they added competitiveness as one of the five, and as, as a criteria. And so what ends up happening in the litigation of those maps, I've sort of seen it in their panels, um, Putting aside, I, I, I buy your point about the state senate. If you look at the congressional map, it's very fair and very competitive in Arizona, and it reflects. I lived in Arizona a long time. It reflects the will of the voters in that state. Um, it's you know the right amount of safe seats, the right amount of, on both sides, and then the right amount of competitiveness, um, and, it, and it reflects the voters. The competitiveness metric checks the process, so it's not a leading factor, but what ends up happening in the creation of the maps is as they're litigating, they're like, well, what do you do? Bring in this precinct and watch what it does to the numbers. Someone's like, well, maybe that makes it too, you know, too, we're getting too far away from competitiveness, so we can't do that. And it brings it back. So, you know, I think that um, all of these are factors we should think about, and maybe maybe the answer is that no one factor gets to run supreme over others. That's another way to do the partisan boundary, right? You don't have to do efficiency gap. You could just say partisan can't be the determining factor. It can't be the preeminent factor. It can be one, but it can't be the only. That's another way. So, so some of it is, you know, what's the mix of the factor, right? I, I worked for Leader Pelosi for a long time. She always says the beauty's in the mix. Um, what's the mix of the factors that we're looking at and how do we weigh them against each other? But I, I don't think that we need to think about um, competitiveness as contrarian to communities of interest or to minority representation. I think we're, we, um, you know, we're seeing a lot of Look at yesterday. Di diversity abounds in those races in very competitive districts. Um, you know, two of the GOP flips in the Virginia State Legislature were two Latina women, n first time ever elected to the to the um, House of Delegates in Virginia. Right? There is a real diversity in this country that I think we can reflect in our districts using a multitude of different factors. And and I think when you really dig in with communities of color, that's a conversation that that is you know ripe and having within communities. And and there we 
we have to build trust always, but I do really believe and hope that we can have districts that reflect the beautiful diversity of our country and not have that be part of what we just accept as polarization. Uh, yes, over here. <laughs> Sorry. I'm curious what both of you think of the um, possibility of returning to at-large districting for small and medium-sized states. That is, returning to the situation before the 1842 law that set up one, one, one uh, member of the House for each district within a state, and perhaps dividing up a state like Texas, where, where I live, into, say, six or eight districts, something like that, but having much larger districts than we currently have with multiple members. Good. If you could identify yourself also. I sure, I'm Cynthia before. Levinson, um, and I, I, I just wrote a book with my husband, Sandy Levinson, who teaches here at the law school for kids called Fault Lines in the Constitution, and we have a chapter on what he calls gerrymandering, and that's one of the suggestions in that chapter. <laughs> Very good. Um, well, look, I think that um, the, the, the beautiful part about our process is that theory at some point meets practicality, right? And so there is real depth in proportional representation in at large. In um, You know, Vox just did a big video about how proportional repre representation is actually the better solution than fixing gerrymandering. Great, awesome. I think all of that is valuable. Um, I think that for, for us as political strategists, you know, it, we gotta we gotta think about what's real and possible, and um, I, I personally think that some of those types of innovations we're just not there yet. Where you know we gotta walk before we can run, um, and I don't know that from a practical applicability standpoint we're ready to um, to completely reform our, our de representative democracy in that way. However, there are th things like my recommendation or, or th really good ideas like that that need to be sort of figured out. Try them at the local level, right? I think there's a um, I think it's Oregon where there is proportional representation like for the city elections um, and and there are some innovations that are being tried out at the mayoral level or at the city council level like try it great awesome like that's the kind of thing that will bubble up to the top um, and I think that continuing to do research and to you know match those theories with practicality wherever you can makes all of us smarter um, and you know these are the kinds of, of rolling innovations that we see throughout time so I, I don't think we're there yet in terms of going there and, and fighting for that as, as a way to do all of democracy um, and all of representation, but it's super interesting and, and um, in a lot of ways more efficient than gerrymandering by one district as it's currently done, or redistricting by one district. Chris, multi-member, di big, bigger districts or other kind of moonshot? <clears throat> um, I don't think it's practical to, to reach that kind of uh, conversion of our process. I, I wanted to point out in the state of Washington, uh, there's a state senate district and then they, they have to draw the two house seats underneath that so you have to stay within the boundaries of the senate district so there's still room for mischief but it, it limits it um, because you know I got this whole thing about rubber bands and the bigger they are the more they stretch but essentially just trust me it's it's harder um, <laughs> I also want to throw, plug in a plug for Iowa um, Iowa has a system always had nobody gets screwed uh, no one has control. They come and they make sure that there's equal representation and they just come up with a compromise. A couple things about Iowa. Until recently, not very demographically diverse. They do have a growing Hispanic vote now. So, and they're also square and all their counties are pretty square. And <laughs> you go up and you left and right. It, it is possible to get lost in Iowa, but um, it, you're, you're lost on a grid. Um, and so I remember when I, you know, I talked to the speaker who, who won control, and I said, so, you know, what's going to happen in redistricting? And he said, well, we're going to sit down with the Democrats and redraw the lines. <laughs> He's like, that's just the way we do it. So there's a culture there, yeah. you know? And then, you know, Governor Hogan of Maryland recently went to the Democrat congressional, uh, which is ironically where Camp David is, Maryland, um, <laughs> and said, hey, um, let's do something like Iowa. No one controls this, but let's come up, let's see if we can agree on something better. And of course, the Democrats are, they said no, thank you, looks good right now. Um, <laughs> and so, uh, you know, the idea that you're going to export Iowa is difficult because it's, 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 it's just ingrained and it's also demographically easy. Yeah. 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 Other questions? 
yes, with the uh, blue blazer. And if, again, if you could identify yourself first. Sure. Um, I'm Colleen Mathis. I'm the current chair of the Arizona Independent Redistricting Commission. And so my ears are burning. <laughs> and with all due respect to Mr. Jankowski, I did want to address his point about our um, mapping consultant that we hired, because we hear this a lot. Um, the commission draws the lines. The mapping consultant is there as a technical advisor. The commission, all, all five commissioners in Arizona direct that um, consultant to draw the lines accordingly. And that's based on input from the public and all comers, frankly, who come to our hearings and, and want to supply input on what they'd like to see. Um, but I did want to also mention competitors. Could you say how the commission, uh, and maybe not everyone knows, how the commissioners are selected? <laughs> Sure. Um, commissioners apply. So any citizen in Arizona can apply, um, assuming they meet the various criteria of um, not having been a paid lobbyist or an elected official in the past three years. And there's a variety of things. But anybody can apply. And um, two Democrats and two Republicans are chosen by majority and minority leadership. And then those four commissioners, once impaneled, choose the fifth um, commissioner and that 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 person ends up being the chair and um, they can be from the Green Party the Independent Party they can be from anywhere unaffiliated um, as long as they're not R's or D's so that's kind of the process and then the Commission on Appellate Court Appointments vets all of those applications there's interviews and um, a vetting process and then ultimately 10 R's 10 D's and 5 I's are chosen um, put on a slate um, for majority minority leadership to choose from and then those commissioners to choose the independent chair so um, but I did want to mention competitiveness I'm so glad that it has been brought up because I think Arizona may be the only yeah. state that has um, that as an official criterion it is. and it's really important because in Arizona what the voters voted on um, was to create maps that ensure fair and competitive districts so that was in the preamble language of what people were voting on when they voted on the proposition. So competitiveness is important to people there. And I think I read a quote once attributed to uh, Dean Fung about um, competition and, the, and that the magic of democracy is rooted in competition. And I love that. I've used that quote myself because I believe that. I'm a registered independent. I'm a postpartisan and just believe that um, it, to the extent you can encourage voters to come out and vote when they feel like their vote matters, and I'm proud to say Arizona has the most competitive district in the country, the district I'm from, which is CD2 right now. Um, that's the former Gabby Giffords district. That um, district, the election was decided by 161 votes um, a, a couple cycles ago. So there your vote really matters. You really need to get out there. And to me, that's what is so great about competitiveness. So I would encourage any states considering reform. And I agree, independent commissions may not be the um, be all end all for every state. It does depend on local conditions. But um, for Arizona, it, it makes a lot of sense. And I really um, think competition should be a criterion that gets elevated to um, an equal level, which it actually is in Arizona. Um, the commissioners have to weigh all the traditional redistricting criteria, but also competitiveness equally to um, ensure that we're doing what we can to um, bolster that. Um, so that's what I would say. But thank you. I appreciate the comments. And actually, if all, if I would love to see you guys in your efforts to reform redistricting bring competitiveness forward as something, and, and bipartisanship, a bipartisan approach to um, reform across the country. That would be great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think we have time for a couple more questions if folks want to, other, uh, yes, the gentleman over there, fourth row. Thank you. My name is George Christie. I'm with a national organization called State Voices. So we work with about 800 nonprofits to bring them into the civic engagement process. My question, I think, is for Kelly. You said that um, grassroots involvement was clutch. So we have a pretty good idea on how to engage in nonpartisan elections, voter registration, education, turnout. 
it's not so clear to us what that involvement looks like. So could you say more about that? Yeah, and some I have a lot to say on this. Yes, thank you for asking. Wow, awesome. Um, I'm an organizer. Here's how we organize, y'all. Okay, so here's the thing. Um, the registering process is very complicated, right? It is different in every state. And in some states, it's even different congressional and state ledge. And how the map is drawn, state ledge, House and Senate is tricky and different. So the very first thing I think all citizens need to do is get educated on how redistricting works in your state. In Arizona, for example, that commission process is very um, complicated, but you, you, anyone can join. As long as you meet the criteria, you can submit a resume and get on the commission. So I think the early process Process of getting educated, understanding how the redistricting process works in your state, and, and if you have a state like Arizona um, where there is room for citizen participation, recruit your friends. It's just like, it's democracy, right? Run for office, get in there, submit your application to be in the panel of people who might be considered for the commission. In California, you know, anyone can get on that commission. You know, there are criteria, but it's, it's broad. So there is, um, there is, there's, there's value in just getting smarter on the process itself. That's sort of step number one. Step number two is, as with anything, if you have an issue that you care about, go hit the legislature, like hit them up, you know, ask them to sign pledges, go to the legislature and say, we care about this. We want to know where you stand on redistricting, where you stand on fairness. You know, do you commit to having a, f a fair process? Do you commit to bipartisanship working across the aisle? You know, start that conversation with legislators now. The, the, the process of how legislatures draw maps is even different. Some of them have an actual formal committee. Some of them appoint, um, a, you know, a panel. Some of them, it's, it's up to the, the jurisdiction or discretion of the chairs um, or, you know, the leadership. Um, you know, you could get engaged on campaigns on a redistricting topic to say, you know, do you com do you commit to you know the people being appointed to the panel or bipartisan, whatever it might be. Um, there's a way to go local and figure out what's the right pledge or question to really lean in on your legislators. Starting now, you know, make it a campaign issue. Um, at, go to campaigns and candidates and talk about it. All of that good organizing work just to show the members of, that you, that you care, that that people care, that people are paying attention to this. Um, there are house parties happening around the country all the time. There was an article and some dude in Michigan just started hosting house parties on redistricting and there was a whole <laughs> article about him he's just like this is an important thing I got a PowerPoint do y'all want to come over like let's get smarter and now Michigan has a 300,000 you know a ballot initiative with over 300,000 signatures to reform the process in Michigan I mean it really can start from the bottom um, of people getting smarter educating their friends and then starting that grassroots community organizing and conversation um, to to the elected official also so that's just like now, right? Like, get going. In the process itself, in 2021, people attending the, the redistricting process matters. My gut is, my gut, is that this is the very first redistricting process ever in the history of ever that will be democratized, right? Everyone's going to have a map. Look, the tools are on the internet, right? Like Daily Cost is going to have a map. Everyone's going to tweet a map. You can draw maps. You have, you know, f fabulous professors that like on the press of a button, you can draw a million maps options, right? People are going to have the information. The information is going to be, democ d you know, democratized and in the hands of the voters. And that always helps you know, make the legislative process smarter. So I think the, the using the tools of that kind of democratic small d process of redistricting and getting ready for it. If we mobilize to the hearings, you know, if we go to the hearings and we say, here, we, we drew a map, consider this map. Let me give you an example. I'm sorry, I know I'm in the weeds. I'm sorry. But here's an example of the impact that this can have. In Virginia, in the last round of redistricting, again, people were, for the most part, not paying attention to this. There was a professor at George Mason who was like, hey, I have an idea. I want to see if my students can draw better maps than the legislature. Won't that be fun? And so he just launched a contest. He was like, let's do a contest. Do you guys want to draw some maps? And the students were like, yeah, cool. So they drew maps, put them on the internet. We looked at those maps. We were like, that map is better than the legislature's map. This map is more fair. It's an indication of what's possible in the map, which to your point, politicians aren't necessarily going to be interested in doing. Of course, the legislature didn't care. It was all political. Fine. In the lawsuit against the Virginia map, the judge cited the George Mason contest. <laughs> The judge was like, hey, you could have used those. They were there. They were on the internet. You chose not to use them. You're bad. 
you broke the law. So I'm not a lawyer. Can you tell? But that happened. So my point is, like, citizen engagement, it mattered on the margins a little bit when, like, no one was chewing it. Imagine we can put that on steroids if we try and we're intentional about it. And I think that is the kind of stuff that on net is going to make the whole thing more fair. It just is because you have people involved, right? And that checks the politicians, to your point. So all of that. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Let's get organized. People I, involved I, in the redistricting I can't process. Argue with a lot of that. I will simply say that the Virginia maps that were subject to the litigation she referenced were agreed to by the Democrats in the congressional That's delegation. Yeah. All right, and they were passed by a, a, a state Senate controlled by Democrats. We had a House Republicans. We had a Republican governor and a Democrat Senate. A state senator who's now a congressman, shocker, uh, didn't like the maps. And he brought a lawsuit that, um, you know, I think had some merit. And so those uh, districts were adjusted. The state senator got his district. <laughs> Don't want to be cynical. Um, but we went from 8-3 to 7-4, which is getting Closer. somewhat reasonable. Yep. And 18 looks bad after yesterday. The other thing is, um, and this is Virginia-specific, but it, I think it applies anywhere, to your organizing groups, uh, if a Republican steps up and, and wants to work with you and stands up against their party, you need to be there for them. That's right. And Virginia 2021, uh, which is an incredible group, and Brian Cannon is, uh, runs it. He's a stone-cold pro. Uh, you know, my client, Jill Vogel, state senator, ran for lieutenant governor, they didn't endorse her. Uh, her opponent, Justin Fairfax, took their position, said, I'm, I'm with you. He's never held office. He's never had to take a tough vote. He's never had, I mean, she has been in there fighting her own party, going into the House Republican Committee and putting them on TV cameras, making them kill this bill, right? She didn't get endorsed. That sends a bad message, folks. So that's I, fair. I mean, that's I a just good point. that's a super good point. You know, can I can I build on that? Because this is how we're going to ultimately get to fairness, even with politicians. He's right. That is what happened in Virginia. All the politicians just cut deals. That's what they did. But the reason they were able to do that is because the voters didn't care. Nobody's paying attention. So as politicians, they have the luxury to cut deals behind closed doors because there's no accountability from the voters. So we can all prevent that kind of backdoor behavior and deal cutting if we are engaged. And if that member of Congress, who frankly just wanted a safer seat and got it because he cut deals with Republicans, if he knew that people were paying attention and we were like, his district was like, no, no, competitiveness, no, no, we want to make sure that the, you know, that the, the diversity in your district is represented properly, like that, that will matter to these members and it will matter to the, the conversation around redistricting. They just, they've never felt that heat before on redistricting, to be honest, because it's been a very backdoor conversation. We can change that next time. Alex. Uh, Mike's coming. <clears throat> Do you folks have a sense, uh, one reads a lot about the amount of self-sorting that's going on um, and geographic self-sorting uh, of, of, of the electorate. Um, you know, and there are figures like I, th I think in California, even after the commission redistricted um, in 2012, no, none of the congressional seats, more than 50 of them, changed parties uh, in, in, in that election. So do you have a sense of what proportion of District, you can talk about in terms of congressional, you know, or within a state in the legislature. What, what proportion of, of seats basically are not going to, or it's not going to be arrangeable to have them be competitive races, right? That, that basically That's one party is going to dominate the area. I mean, is that, in your view, is that 5%, 35%? Well, the Cook political report right now currently rates uh, 174 Democrat seats as they're going to stay Democrat unless something really crazy happens. And Republican has 179 of those seats. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, somewhere in those numbers. And I would point out in 2016, the uh, number of counties that, who, that went for one presidential candidate or another by a double-digit margin or some really substantial margin, it increased significantly. So, like, we are we are living separately. 
not talking to each other, and, and it does make it harder. So it's, it's, um, it's getting worse. It's so easy to light a fire uh, with uh, your base. It's so cheap. You can target them online. You can get on you know, whatever medium. It's so hard. It's expensive to talk to what's left of the middle. Um, and that's another, there's so many things that are working constantly that are, you know, as part of the complexity I was talking about. So uh, another set of numbers to share with you that demonstrate what we could have, what it should be or what we could do if it was fair. Um, in the, in the, there, it, there are 26 states that make up 85% of the congressional districts. Um, the Brennan Center did, in the House, the Brennan Center did a study that showed that if those states were not as gerrymandered as they are, Democrats would have 16 to 17 more seats than they currently have. Just if you reset to, to neutral, um, that, that you'd see a, a 16 to 17 seat Democratic reset. Um, I don't know how that then applies to, you know, the, the um, sorting since then, but on the maps in the current, you know, sort of deficit that's created off of the gerrymandering, that's a, a number to think about. There's a really important study that was done um, called unintended gerrymandering that, that speaks to this point. And I think your point about competitiveness and, and what are the underlying tenets of democracy, you know, that's, that's why we need to think hard about these questions, because you know, the sorting is a real thing and that there is a reality to where people are living and how we're not living together. So does that then mean we're just destined for polarized legislatures? You know, we, we can choose to accept that or we can choose to question that. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's the kind of work that needs to get done to answer your question. We will take one more, one more question and then... Uh... We'll have a few minutes before the next panel. Hi, my name is Alice Lee, and I was wondering, so something that's been proposed to kind of follow on the previous question is a top two system where it's not just so top that in order to kind of encourage yeah. people away from just playing to their primary base because that's when they're going to get voted out. Um, do you have any thoughts on that? And do you feel like that has any context that, or any um, meaning in a conversation about ger gerrymandering? Uh, this is going to be controversial. I personally think top two is a terrible idea. I think the way that it's played out in California is actually anti-democratic, small d democratic. I think you have voters that um, are ultimately disengaged or, or um, disenfranchised is a strong word because the system is fair, but because it's working the way it's set up, you know, the way it is written in law. But, um, you know, you have entire elections where Republicans don't have an option. So why are they going to vote? Why are they going to care? You know, um, you have seats where, you know, we had, a, we had a Democratic seat where that Barack Obama won by 57% in 2012 that by a virtue of the top two ended up with two Republicans the, in the, for the congressional seat. That Republican was very extreme and didn't reflect the voters at all. And, the, the, you know, those voters in that district didn't have a choice. They didn't have the option to elect someone of their choice. So I, I personally think the top two is, is damaging to the voters. Um, but, but that's my personal opinion. There's so much fun. I mean, uh, yeah. <laughs> you, you can really do some stuff. You cause so yeah. much trouble in these races. <laughs> and um, <laughs> probably because of that, I think they're a bad idea. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, I, I mean, <laughs> how much time do you have? I mean, <laughs> and, and, and I mean, that example, I got so many. Typically, people who are, well, I'll just leave it at that. How about that? <laughs> Good. Well, Thank you very much, both of you, for exposing us to your expertise and your thinking and injecting some reality. Thank you very much. I want